Okay, so here I'm going to go over forensic photography methods and things you might want to be considering. And this is some things that make it advantageous if you get a camera that allows you to adjust some features. Because it can really allow you to maximize the shot. Considering you can't move the object or change a lot of things, by adjusting the camera you can capture the information of the image that you need. So starting first, uh, general methods. Looking at all photographs must contain three elements. The subject, a scale, and a reference object. Now we have a prime example of the footprint here with a nice scale, kind of got the subject, got a reference object. I included a website here at the bottom that at the time of videotaping this video here, so it's active and it allows you to print out um, something just like this to allow you to include this in any images that you may take or want to practice with. Um, it's a great way to kind of have um, color correction, have size, have scale, have contrast, um, really allows um, a set um, distance. So it really allows you to add a lot of these elements to the photographs that you take. Oh, so what should our crime scene photographs should contain what? Well, as we can kind of see in the images here, uh, they should always be in focus. So in the case, it's kind of easy when they're in a controlled environment, but we don't want to move them. So we need to make sure that they are in focus. They also need to be kind of the main object within the photograph. Again, this depends what photographs we're taking, but it's particularly talking about the object contain a scale or ruler. So as we can see in these images, while they are all listed as 45, uh, they all contain that nice scale, allowing us to know the exact size of that object and also it number tags it, which is great for organization purposes. Uh, that scale or ruler, uh, having a little right angle here also helps uh, be a fair and accurate representation of what is seen. So while we have that as our main object, what's around it or where it may occur be, or be placed or be left, also important. Any change in color may misidentify an object or investigators and possible jurors. So this is why we want to have our photographs be as accurate to true life as possible. So which one of these is the best representation? So we have a couple options here. We have photograph one and photograph two. Now photograph two is the correct representation. So a lot of people look at photograph one and say that's a little bit brighter. Well, you're losing some of the detail. Photograph one has too much light. It means that the photographer failed to catch the proper light to describe the object. By adjusting the flash, the photographer should adjust the camera flash uh, to capture the object in the detail as well. The reason why we want this level of detail and scale is if I took this out here and just kind of took a picture of the turtle, you wouldn't know if that's an adult, a large turtle, or a small turtle. By putting some hands, showing how small it is, uh, that gives us that perspective or that correct representation. Uh, so be mindful, here's two objects, the exact same, uh, but that slight difference of cutting down the light really takes into account a lot more of the detail now. Uh, when taking the photographs, now with the digital aid, we are taking a lot of photographs, which is great, but we also need to keep a photograph log. This should be done as you're taking the pictures. Uh, the responding officer must also maintain this log of any photographic evidence that is taken. It should contain the date, the time of the, of the photograph, the subject matter, and any additional notes. It should be done in order. And also, who took those pictures. Very important if there's two people taking pictures. These logs must be maintained within a case file or incident report as they are part of the examination record and discoverable material at trial. It's important, as much as people don't like to do this, to be updating this log as you're taking the pictures. Because you might uh, stumble across something, go in a different direction, you want to be making sure that you're kind of always making that subject in those comments as you're taking the pictures. Now there's three components of photography. There's ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. And this is kind of a great way of kind of creating a quick little comparison. Aperture, a small aperture, will get a further depth of field. The larger aperture tends to focus more closer. Shutter speed, the faster the shutter speed, you can stop a moving object. The slower the shutter speed will blur an object if it is moving. Typically on crime scenes, the objects aren't moving all that fast. ISO, low sensitivity and high sensitivity can get a little bit more grading, uh, potentially, depending on other factors that we may be using with our cameras. So ISO, just to start here, International Organization for Standardization uh, relates to cameras' sensitivity to light. Back in the days of film, there was, they were sold in different ISOs. But this creates a great contrast here, photograph one, photograph two. Uh, shutter speed is the same, focus is the same, but the ISO is different. Here's ISO of 100, and you can barely make that object out. Here's 1600, and it's very clear. In dark environments, the ISO makes light sensor of the camera more sensitive. So increasing the ISO will allow this in a dark environment to show quite well. ISO has a high possibility to make camera noise, which is kind of blurriness, uh, which can cause that visual distortion. 
too much dependence on ISO can distort the image. So knowing your camera, knowing how to adjust certain things is great. If you're left with only adjusting ISO, go as least as possible so you don't get noise and distortion for your images. Shutter speed. Shutter speed is the length of time when the film or the digital sensor inside the camera is exposed to light. So here we have a slow shutter speed to get that kind of smoothing of the water, that kind of cascade effect. Here's our two images shot with different shutter speeds, one, one 25th of a second, one 400th. These two photographs taken are the same situation except the shutter speed is changed. The slow shutter speed makes the image more clear and bright because the low shutter speed takes in more light than the higher shutter speed. However, high shutter speed is often necessary for moving objects. But in this case, we see kind of can make out one fingerprint sort of kind of here. Here we can make out that one for sure, but also several others. Also, the ruler is much clearer visible here, allowing us to get a better idea of the size of that object. So here's an example of adjusting shutter speed and how it can vastly impact the image. Aperture or focus. So aperture means uh, the extent with the sharpness of an image is shown with the lens. Here we can see a list of candles, or um, a line of candles, one, two, three, four, all pretty well in focus. Here the first one's a little blurry, the second one looks great, third one's a little blurry, and the fourth one definitely is blurry and definitely the background. So photograph one, all of are very clearly visible with a high aperture. Photograph two, the image shows an object with the right focus, but the rest of the objects are all blurred because of low aperture. This would be important if this is the one you're looking at focusing on for some reason, but this tells a little bit better story of where these objects are and what is also located behind them. So it's important to keep aperture and focus in mind, which might be limited based on the light and other factors. Lastly, the flash. Um, we're looking at flash of the camera. It's a white balance of the photo. Flash units set to mimic daylight to ensure proper color balance of the subject matter. Be mindful, though, of reflections, particularly of um, glass objects or shiny objects that can occur due to the flash. Here we have the flash is indirect. You can take the flash point upwards at the ceiling. Here it's directly on the image, and you can see how it really distorts it. This adds enough light so you can see in detail, but doesn't distort anything. It doesn't have any reflections because this can demonstrate flashups either removed from the camera body, creating the angle, or bounced off the ceiling or some other object, um, because you want it to be well lit, but you do not want it to distort or kind of cause that blurriness to occur um, due to the flash. So these are just some important key items to keep in mind when we're looking at studying our um, photography skills and making sure that we're capturing quality images uh, that really depict what was seen at the crime scene.